Welcome to the Equestrian Perspective Podcast. I'm Felicity Davies and I'm here to simplify horse training and teach you absolutely everything you need to know about how to build both your own and your horse's confidence levels, form an amazing relationship together and feel empowered in any environment. And on this podcast, I'll be sharing my best advice, trainings and mindset shifts so you can truly connect with your horse and pursue your goals in a way that feels good for both of you. So get ready to embark on a new equestrian perspective and I'll see you on the other side. Welcome back to the Equestrian Perspective podcast and today I have with me Jenny Nellist and Jenny is a clinical animal behavioralist and I was waiting for myself to stuff up (laughs) saying that word because it's a long word Um, but yeah I'm really excited to have Jenny with me here today she shares a lot of great information via her facebook posts and things like that so i think you guys will find her really interesting um but jenny can you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about a little bit about you and where you're based and what you currently do at the moment hi yeah absolutely thank you very much for having me so um i'm based in south wales in the united kingdom um and i work Um, on my day-to-day basis with people who own horses and people who own dogs and who are having a problem with the behavior of those animals and I come in to really kind of collaborate with them to to help them so uh, I'm very much on as the owner as being the expert in their own animal and I'm there as the expert in that species behavior and we work together to work out why the horse or suppose it's the dog is doing what they're doing and what we're going to change to help change their behavior to something that is um, more acceptable for the owner or um, more comfortable for the animal. So quite often people contact me because they're worried that their animal is um, is very stressed or very anxious or feeling some kind of negative state. So I'm really there to help people out. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. I love it. Um, well, I'd love to hear more about your journey with horses and how you came to dive into that, because I think it's really interesting. And I like that you said that you're, the owners are the expert in the animal side of things and what they know about that individual. And you're the expert in the behavior so that you can really collaborate together. And I think that's really, I really like the way that you just descri- describe that because you're giving the owner a lot of power because they do know so much about their own animals because they're the ones around them all the time so I just wanted to touch on that I think that's a really cool way of um, explaining it but can you please um, tell us a little bit more about when did you start riding like how old were you when you got your first horse or how did that all come about oh yeah I I nagged and nagged at my parents so I come from a non-equestrian background Um, my mum would kind of like to have ridden when she was a child but the family circumstances weren't that, that was possible I mean there's a lot of kind of country in um, my background um, my family was kind of rural living but just not equestrian and then um, I got to ride my aunt also my aunt obviously did manage to wing this one her she lived in Italy at the time and they kept uh, a couple of horses and we would go and visit them it's a very um wonderful thing to have done and it would be very small and being sat in front of my aunt on her gelding who was just the steadiest loveliest horse he was called Robbie he was an Anglo-Arab he was just mm. such a sweet horse and it, that's kind of my first experience I didn't mm. really get any riding lessons until I was nine my mum and dad were like you have to show a commitment to wanting this hobby you can't just pick it up on a whim and then stop because riding lessons are expensive so you've got to really yeah, show commitment. I think by now I've shown a lot of commitment to the course, but that's I started riding at a local riding school. And my favorite little pony there was a Welsh pony called Toro. It was a fabulous blue roan color. He was just, yeah, it's just the most amazing pony in the world. Um, I didn't get a horse of my own until I was a teenager, and I was helping out at the local stables. And this lady was going, um, traveling for nine months who was going to Australia uh, where you are <laughs> going yeah. to um, travel and so her horse was just kind of going spare so I got to have him on loan and the loan ended up from going for nine months to four years um, and I did all the pony club kind of things I did show jumping on him I did some pony club eventing on him um, made lots of mistakes learned things that I wouldn't do again necessarily but it was um, a kind of a really good experience and like, joining in the teams and things so mm-hmm. absolutely love that so that horse was Prince um, 
and he was uh, he was really fantastic because he was like a half thoroughbred half Irish kind of horse and we didn't I didn't know anything about his breeding just that he was um he was skibbled or bay and white um which was kind of rare for sports horses to be coloured in the 90s <laughs> in the 90s and that was like, I remember that being at the farm they go oh no he can't have any thoroughbred in him he can't he's coloured you can't have coloured thoroughbreds mm. and then I met at a show the person who brought him over from Ireland who basically confirmed his breeding and he's basically had the same fire um chip fell as Bruce Davidson's horse um eagle lion that went double clear around badminton in 95 and i didn't really i didn't mean anything to me at the time because it wasn't really internet you look these things up and i didn't read horse and hand that seriously so i was like oh yeah so he is half thoroughbred and that was it and then when i found out i was like oh, good job i didn't know that when i actually had this horse because i'd have been such a brat <laughs> <laughs> so i was very privileged to have such a fantastic horse it just appeared um and uh, yes yeah. He probably wasn't as ambitious as Abington, but he could certainly take me across the country. <laughs> Love it. Amazing. Um, and, okay, so how old were you about this stage? So I was um, 14 when I started riding, 13, 14 when I started riding him. And then when I got to 18, I started to go to university, have to yeah. give the horse back. <laughs> what did you study at um, Equine science. Okay, cool. So, so I was on... Okay. Yeah, I was on one of the first equine science degrees in the UK um, that was at Aberystwyth University. So they'd already been running a master's programme about the 70s or something like that. It was a long running master's programme and then they were one of the first UK universities to then start having a BSc as well. Cool, cool. And had you always wanted to like work with horses or study in that area? Yeah, my parents just never said you should show commitment to get those riding lessons, but there we are. <laughs> So, so yeah, I really like doing stuff with horses. I really wanted to be an equine nutritionist. Yeah, I read all the magazines. I was learning about different careers you could do. And Aberystwyth was the place to go if you were going to be interested in nutrition. Because at the time, Professor Moore Collier, Mary Moore Collier was there. She was like nutrition lady. She was really fabulous. She'd have a gorgeous bias of a color like that. And, you know, she's behind hay gain, um, which we see so now. And I remember her talking about steaming hay back then. And now she has hay gain out. And I'm like... So good. Um, but yeah, that's what I really wanted to do. But there's a lot of math involved in nutrition. It was competitive to get into, and we also got um, lectures in animal behaviour and welfare. Yeah, and I did a little bit of ecology and ethology as well. And I was like, wow, this behaviours look really much more interesting. Yeah. Um, so I kind of left there with a commitment to doing something to do with behaviour and welfare. So a degree project um, following around hill pony mares down in uh, on Gow, where I live now, my introduction to the area really. And I just did a seven week field study recording the behavior of mares while there was a stallion present because at the time the breeders would put out um, a registered stallion for um, the summer and then remove him to wherever his next job was going to be, as it were. Um, and yeah, so I was looking at what mayors did when he was present and what they did when he wasn't present. So that was quite interesting in itself and just dip me into the whole world of what horses do when they're just being horses and no one's really interfering apart from abducting husbands. <laughs> and um, can you share what you were able to find in the, in the differences? I'm really curious. Yeah, so their time budgets were very similar all the way through. So they would commit to a certain amount of sunbathing and a certain amount of grazing and resting during the day um they when the stallion went they shifted their home range entirely so when he was there he, they were always in one not one particular spot they were in an area that was nearer to the farm where the stud was located so where the stud was located they had another stallion there and there were supposed to have been two stallions running out on the hill but they kept fighting and because you're basically paying to lease these stallions you can't really for other people's stallions so they brought one in and he had some mares in and till they were all bred then they went back on the hill and basically the stallion I was following around was would go and prospect over to the stud just to check maybe if there were any more interesting ladies um 
And there was a day where he just left the mares for a day and spent the day running up and down outside the blood, apparently, while I was watching the mares. And the mares stayed in the one spot the whole day until he came back. Um, but when he left, they were like, oh, we can go over to the other side of the road now and the other side of our normal range, because it turns out that would have been their normal range when I went and visited them in the winter. And they just kind of spread out. It's like, oh. And what he'd actually had is these, there were, they were, there were 16 mares, but they were actually little subgroups of mares and they all kind of come together around the stallion. And he obviously wouldn't let them leave either. I don't think his stallion behaviour would have been entirely natural compared to the stallion that had grown up on a range because these are ones that are more domesticated and they're turned out into a whole new area and they have exclusive, almost exclusive rights to the mares there because there aren't other stallions. And if they are, humans interfere, <laughs> as I just kind of described. Um, so I think they would possibly do more kind of herding up the mares, but then that's not really been studied. So that's just me speculating. <laughs> it's a question yeah. really rather than an answer. But yeah, those, those mares did go, you know, they didn't break up straight away. They were still 16, but over, as the rest of the year progressed, they started to shift into their own little groups and you find smaller pockets of ponies here and there instead of one big group. Mm. So I think, yeah. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah. It's in, it's interesting and it may, it makes sense to have huge dynamic shifts and you just think about like people, it's very easy to kind of go, I'm going to move the horses over here. I'm going to split them up over here and I'm going to put this horse in with this horse and think, oh, well, the paddocks yeah. need it best or this is what needs to happen. And it's just like that's a huge deal for their like day, you know what I mean, and their life because you're ch- completely changing their environment. Absolutely because I think – what I have noticed with the hill ponies is they do, they are quite fluid. They do shift around mm. and they do go into different groups. Um, but it's kind of quite a slow process. And sometimes they meet up and go away again. So I've seen some mares that more chop and change around where they go. Some that always stick together in the same groups and you find them in the same kind of places. Mm. And then that group may go meet with another group for a while and then split apart again. Mm. It might be just for an afternoon. So if you just went out on one day, in one time slot you might think that was social grouping but if you go out once a week for a year you find that it's not but it's all on their own volition so I think yeah. if it's done if we interfere tactfully they have the adaptation to cope with a little bit of social mixing but if yeah. there's a lot of social mixing and then lots a lot of resources and it's harder and of course these ponies have grown up out on the hill so the ones I'm thinking of more recently the, the population in the same place that I studied over 20 years ago is now what went it's not it's more organized now but it went through a period of being very unorganized um just because of the human circumstances surrounding that and the, the population became much more like a natural feral population mm. so the stallion numbers increased and we saw more of what you'd expect to see in a, a naturally you know more natural population so that was really interesting to watch that play out yeah I've only documented that with the camera I really like my field notes on my on my photos really (laughs) my recollection yeah cool yeah it'd be so interesting to kind of like study the shifts and there's so many dynamics at play like you do like it would be a lot easier if we could actually talk to them but anyway (laughs) absolutely yeah um Okay, cool. So you finished your uni degree um, and you did this big, um, I had this project. Then yeah. what happened after that? I went to work for a charity called the Blue Cross, which is an animal welfare organisation here in the UK that looks after cats and dogs and various small animals and also looks after horses um, and donkeys, mostly mostly horses and ponies um, because we've got um, really good organisation in the UK called the Donkey Sanctuary that does most of the donkeys and of course there'll be a few other places that do that as well. Um, and so I started there as regular welfare groom. My role was to look after my block of horses and ponies. Um, so the usual stable work, the usual work out in the field, but also training. So I got introduced to um, rehabilitation training there. Um, we did start off going through natural horsemanship programmes um, and at the same time, I started my master's in companion animal behavior counseling. So there was a shift. I was only there for four years, but I sh- shifted from kind of traditional horsemanship through natural horsemanship to learning about behavior modification, um, more of the principles so that I was starting to apply the basic principles uh, of that, as well as obviously I had a lot of mythology from just doing 
you know, my degree project. Mm. So to start looking more at how horses responded and how to apply rehabilitation training to the best of my ability. So it was a great school for my development into becoming an independent um, behaviourist. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was a fantastic role (laughs) yeah so you kind of had like these are your horses like you've got free reign to kind of like manage them and rehabilitate them and yeah yeah so pretty much it is within a team environment so we'd be working together we'd be you know assessing progress between us we'd often pass horses around each other so once the horse got to a certain stage in training with one groom we'd then get them to generalize their training to another groom ready to be home them so it was really lovely that we were able to work together in that way but also that my manager did give me that extra flexibility that I was able to have I had leave of absence didn't get paid leave out but I had leave of absence to go and did I get I can't remember now I did get paid leave of absence I can't remember it's so long ago but I got to go anyway go because the course would run for a week where you'd have intense lectures and then come back so uh, there was a little bit of overlap because I started that course at the end of my time at the Blue Cross but it was great because I could come in and go, right, I want to do more positive reinforcement, for example. Um, I was doing lots more desensitization and counter conditioning together. So gradually exposing or re-exposing horses to things they had problems with, pairing yeah. those experiences up to something much more pleasant for them. Um, and it was very much my kind of learning ground. I had the space to do that before I had to go out and help a client with their horse. It was a really fabulous space. So, yeah, I would help people who are rehoming the animals and also other groans who didn't necessarily have that same knowledge set that I did but helping them expand their own skill set so it was really cool time <laughs> yeah that's awesome cool um okay so one question I had about that so I know that you mentioned about the counter conditioning and using the positive reinforcement in those situations what mm-hmm. is your thoughts on using positive reinforcement with horses that you are like rehoming to other areas? Because I know that when you get into like higher reinforcement rates and things like that, the horses can start to kind of expect that. And I know that you can kind of like, um, I guess, segregate different behaviors or uh, negative reinforcement, different behaviors are positive reinforcement. But how do you manage that transition or did you just use it for certain behaviors? Yeah, at that stage, I was using it for certain behaviours. So um, basically targeting problem areas. So horses that weren't um, compliant with having injections was oh, one yeah. of the first things I did. Horse mm-hmm. who wasn't compliant with the farrier. So by compliant, absolutely terrified of the farrier. <laughs> it's going to be yeah, more yeah. realistic. So where these animals had fears of specific procedures, I was using it for those um, kind of kind of generally so some yeah. of the talks were so bad they never did get rehomed so my kind of my biggest project case was a very very scared horse called pilgrim who came over from um ireland came from a lovely lady who'd really done her best to try and rehabilitate him but he was just beyond her current skill set at the time um and he i he was still there when i left but not that long after I think a year and a half after I left he had a catastrophic injury and had to be his nose which is really sad um you know he'd been kind of coming along but he was really damaged psychologically and to get him up to the stage where he could be rehomed just as a companion horse yeah. out to, to anybody I think that's where it's, I don't think it would matter what training methods would he used for <laughs> him he would have been just far too difficult but then there were other ones yeah like um I remember a 15 hand mare who didn't he had issues around being girthed and um, yeah. back pain issues so we had to work with those things together so the physical therapy and the the retraining had to go kind of hand in glove really but then yeah then they, they, they they're not bad and I think when you rehome from an organization like that and you have the really detailed handover to the new owner you can show them what you've been doing you can go out and yeah. coach them so they're very yeah. accepting of it and I think you are there in that, that expert role and they're there dedicated to rehome a horse as opposed to just go and buy one so they're invested in helping their horse so I find it works really well in that context you've got somebody who's invested in helping and, and someone who's invested in sharing and you can collaborate again which I think is really cool yeah no I think that's a good point to bring up and I just wanted to touch on that because I know that it's like um there's certain nuances in regards to using it and yeah I just thought it would be interesting but it totally makes sense in regards to how you're just counter conditioning them to those things and then you can pass on 
what works to the owner yeah. um, and then go from there. Cool. Okay, yeah. so that was that. And then can you give us a bit of an overview of what you've been, I guess, working on or things that you want to chat about in regards to from that point until now? Yeah, so I left Bluecross only because my partner got a better paid job than me in a different part of the country. <laughs> That's when we moved um, back to Wales. I yeah. think back to Wales because we'd met in Aberystwyth University. I'd actually grown up in Scotland. Not that you can tell by my accent, but that, 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 that's what it, it happened. Um, so I went to, to live in South Wales. We lived in um, a really nice, pretty area called the Vale of Morgan. And I took up a couple of grooming jobs while I was continuing to finish my master's at Southampton. Um, it did behaviour. So I worked on a stud for a while that bred quarter horses. Um, so that's where I really got into my foal handling and stallion handling. And I was basically a sole charge part time groom. So I had to do everything in half a day. Um, they were extensively managed mostly. So it was quite a nice job in that respect. Um, yeah, I, my job was just to go and handle the youngsters, make sure the stallion got his exercise. Um, yeah, make sure the other stallion didn't get into too much trouble. Um, mm. Really enjoyed that. Um, then I went to work at a stables that was a riding school and a livery yard and a bit of a competition yard. Um, mm. So I was working with team chasers and riding school horses and the client's livery horses. She's a groom, but applying all that behaviour in mind stuff, particularly around the handling. The enrichment mm. wasn't too bad there. They had a little turnout product so that they could go out and socialize team chasers get their time in the big arena every day together and they had the stables of the 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 husband there was a vet and he was really keen on making sure the stables were sociable um they'd done a really nice kind of setup and I was just using some of my behavior knowledge to get horses to cope things like having their manes I think they tidied up because I wouldn't say pull because we used to use a solo comb so we wouldn't pull oh, but yeah. you still have that back coming action and the horses go oh my god we're going to pull and then yeah. you'd be cutting it um I remember doing my boss's husband his team chaser and she basically went here's a solo comb go into the main so um off they are we've got a couple of nice like New Zealand eventers and they're just really lovely guys and just do their mains and oh my boss's horse that's fine I wasn't my Bain pulling isn't brilliant when he's a solo comb, but it didn't look too bad. And then I went to the last one and nobody told me he got drugged to have the stump. I just went in and went, oh, he's running in circles. He doesn't like this. So I was just like, okay, well, I'll just break it down. So give him pony cubes for standing still, you know, just his normal regular feed. Um, then teach him that I stroke your mane and I give you food. And he's like, oh, okay. Strokes make it fit. And I just broke down the process and I was halfway through his mane when he was standing quietly and I was onto a lower rate of reward. So I was probably, you know, in the beginning I was rewarding every single movement that I did. And then uh, as and um, the husband walks in and he's like, this is a massive double take. He's like, but I haven't given you any ACP. And I'm like, he has ACP. <laughs> um, I'm doing his mane. And he's like, what do you do? So I explained how I broke it down and, and did all that. Um, yeah, that he just had his first drug-free hairdo. <laughs> yeah, I love those things. And it, it's just such, it like just shaping it out like that and rewarding all those tiny steps along the way, like it really makes such a difference. And it's just like one of those things that I just wish everyone could learn. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'd love to do that. I, I haven't reached out yet. I'd love to reach out to the British Grooms Association um, so I met Lucy Catton, who founded it when I was at the Blue Cross. I literally were meeting. She may not even remember me, but I was just like, wow, there's so many things you can do when you're grooming to make your job easier if you have just Absolutely. a little bit of know-how just to and get horses back. horses happier. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Even grooms are great people who are really dedicated to the care of horses. So I just love to share this kind of info with them. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that's a great idea. Definitely. Because there's clipping, like just everything like washing oh my god there's so much yeah <laughs> there is all of those things just little bits and pieces that the horses have to do it or well, they don't I'm a friend of mine worked for an international event rider right in Italy for a while and you know horses were either good well-mannered horses or they basically had labels attached to them because of their behavior and I can understand if you didn't know any better why you would do that but if you can know a bit better and do things you can find it easier so I'm like oh if only I've been able to show you this at that time then you know you wouldn't be getting attacked with teeth every time you're attacking up 
Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Oh, so much potential. <laughs> yeah, I think there is. I see lots of potential everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I feel like now is a good time than any to pivot into talking about um, weaning because I know that you've touched on this um, like on your Facebook posts and things like that. And I would just love to hear from you because I know that it's something that um, I guess pe- there's a lot of tradition behind how people wean horses and things like that. And I, I'd love to hear your take on what you found in regards to the research side of things um, and what works and what doesn't seem to work as well and like best practices. And then I guess like the link between certain weaning strategies and separation anxiety. Yeah. And, and I just want these really untapped things. So I mean, weaning is something that pretty much every horse, artificial weaning, I mean, when we talk about weaning, so artificial weaning is something that's going to happen um, to pretty much 99.9% of horses. Um, and how we have that happen, I think, has, has a very strong impact on the foal and their development at that time. Mm-hmm. And we've built up... Um, and I've, as was my, I've got very much a UK focus, but I remember going to study um, a night class at a local college when I was still in high school um, and looking at the very traditional text. So I'm just thinking the Jeremy Horton Brown or Powell Smith or whatever he was called in his book on stud management. And you know, there was really a lot of focus on really good nutrition, good hygiene, all these things that you should have, your pasture management, and a real kind of push of having good standards, which a lot of studs, you know, will aspire to. And then there's the rest of that communication, that word of mouth, this is how I did it, or this is how my father did it, and, and this is how we do it. And and the producing an animal they've often got a lot of pride in. I mean, I have seen the other end of the spectrum working in the welfare sector but working with the with breeders you know you're you're producing a bloodline that maybe has been your family for a long time or you're trying to produce particular kind of horse sports or kind of whatever it is there's a lot of you know kind of it's something to have a lot of pride in and we see this at the shows then when the the production of the young stock or the grading for sports horses or its breed society shows and getting those animals out there and having that mutual kind of respect and admiration you're in your community as well and it's such a kind of a powerful thing that kind of community belonging and then to also at the same part of that see the, the keep learning so keeping up that collaboration learning new things and what we kind of you know going back to those books and learning about how to do the good stud management and then we've had this advent of equine science and this offshoot equitation science um and i kind of put them all under one umbrella because it's science about horses mm-hmm. and there's this kind of it's a new thing and getting and it's growing like massively exponentially there's so much research coming out now but and it, it gets more and more you know each year uh, which is wonderful and getting that information out and going actually we get curveballed by some stuff so stuff we think we know and doing it it gets right and sometimes science goes yes that's absolutely right keep doing it that way and then other times the science goes oh um actually that's kind of not as good as we thought and then we have to have that curiosity about why and the humility to change what we're doing i really like to share with you know practice about weaning and sometimes i do hit a nerve and i don't necessarily mean to i think the first post i did that went I, I feel like saying it went viral, but it probably didn't go viral compared to like proper viral, but it went viral from my my post. It went into five figures circulation. I'm like, Holland your hats. And there were so many comments I couldn't keep up. I actually had to stop looking because I think I was on a holiday. It was a weekend and that family life was just like, what will be will be. And now the bottom half of the internet is fighting on my post. And I'm like, whoa. Um, but I really just wanted to share an update of the science. So then I had to go back and post a few more times sharing the actual evidence base because I didn't any evidence in the first one I just went yeah what we hoped would be less stressful actually turns out not to be oh kind of thing so yeah I, I've ended up producing an article for the Equine Insights or I think it was the Insights magazine but uh, uh, Georgie who is the editor there kind of was one of the Equine Insights as a, as a working type I suppose so just sharing that evidence so well, science unfortunately shows that no artificial weaning method is without stress even when they've tried to do less stressful things like weaning at eight months instead of four five months or six months um it, it you know just as a science protocol 
Um, the only one that hasn't shown any stress is where um, Icelandic pony mares and foals were, you know, sort of Icelandic horses, you know, Icelandic horses, mares and foals were just observed to see what happened if you didn't do anything. And they found spontaneous weaning about nine, 10 months, and literally the foals just stopped being suckled. And there was no rejection. You know, the mares weren't chasing them off. It just one day, they stopped doing it. And that was it. Um, and it probably gets to a point where the mare, mare's nutritional investment in the next foal, these were mares that were foal. Again, the, her nutritional investment has to go to the next foal. Probably the milk quality drops off. Um, there's not been any mare milk studies that go as late as when the next foal is due to show the quality or any changes. So that would be really interesting research to do. Mm. Uh, it does, the milk quality research because um, in some countries, horses are milk for human consumption. So they, there is science on mares, mares milk quality in early versus late lactation. So early lactation is first three months. Late lactation would be three months to six months because they're probably still taking foals off um, kind of at that stage. And it shows that, yes, the, the nutritional quality really dips. So the mare isn't putting loads of her own body nutrition yeah. into the milk at that later stage. It seems a big fear because... I think one of the barriers to weaning late is I think weaning at six months probably came in to try and maintain condition on thoroughbred brood mares who are going to be harder to keep, you know, keep weight on, especially if they've raced before becoming brood mares because they'll have expended a lot of energy into exercise instead of growing and growing fat cells. Whereas I guess those Icelandic mares probably had a good number of fat cells that they can deal yeah. with weaning naturally. Um, that yeah it's going back to input with keeping the foal on the mare as long as possible because like i said before if we're going to artificially wean we can't really do it without stress the science doesn't support that that that, that happens so we have to find ways of feeding the mare enough having a breeding frequency enough maybe if you've got a really super Race, race, race horses don't allow embryo transfer yet they because of the potential for fraud um, so but I think in sports horses we can do that so if we've got a mare who think actually want to protect her we could pop the embryo in a surrogate mare who's maybe yeah. a better doer that's probably one way around it so that you can leave the foal with the surrogate because the foal's not going to know that that's a surrogate mummy because it's popped in there when I was an embryo so they don't know any different um you know they're going to go all the way through so yeah I kind of ramble off on this a bit but one of the things I want to kind of bring up with the weaning is there was the study by Amanda Badnell Waters and Christine Nichol that but that was done at the end of the 90s and that really showed that crib biting on set within weeks of artificial weaning more so if the foals were weaned into a barn as a group instead of into pasture as a group. And if they were weaned into stables, then that was even more likely to happen. So if you put a foal into an unfamiliar environment without his mum, and even worse if it's without familiar individuals, then it is massively stressful. And if, you know, we've had that later research where um, scientists, scientists just wanted to look at some um, a blood marker for gastric ulcers and they know well we know how to get gastric ulcers we wean the foal six months boom um and six months give or take so somewhere a bit younger than we near seven months 85 percent of them got clinically significant lesions wow. in, in their gut and before weaning only about eight percent of them had clinically significant lesions foals do tend to be a bit prone to gastric ulceration anyway but once you that massive stressor on them of weaning then they're getting gastric ulcers so if we're causing gastric ulcers and we're and if we're causing cribbing in animals that are predisposed to crib what are we setting up these animals for later in life given that most horses are bred to be somebody's riding horse whether that's as a sports horse for a professional mm. or a sports horse for an amateur or a leisure horse um, those horses are all supposed to work quietly and safely or reasonably quietly and safely with people compliantly certainly and we want them to be healthy and we don't really know you know how many foals outside of experimental setup get ulcers because people don't check they got my foal looks all right on the outside but we know now that you can only diagnose gastric ulcers definitively by putting a tube in their stomach to look there is no other um that's the gold standard there's no other way of assessing a gastric ulcer so or um, diagnosing one so 
yeah, if this is happening to more foals than we think, and horses being mm. the prey animals there, they're going to be quite historic about that. The foal could look perfectly fine on the outside, but could be in pain on the inside. Then we've got the crib biting starting, so we know it's a big stressor. So in some of these individuals, we could be setting them up for separation anxiety later, depending on how the weaning was held, uh, mm. conducted, and how they were handled afterwards. So there is some research that shows if you isolate weanlings and handle them intensively for a couple of weeks, they lose their fear responses and they become more attracted towards people. The mechanisms underlying that are not fully understood. It almost sounds a little bit like Stockholm syndrome to me, but I don't want to kind of cast too much blur on it because the truth is we don't know definitively. But yeah, we know that the Fall New Zealand guys are training foals, they're very foals younger before any time with their weaning. So that's probably a better way to do it. Um, so finding ways to get in and do foal training younger. I know Lisa Ashton is doing some work with Manx St. John, who breed dressage horses in the UK. Um, mm-hmm. you know, she's been actually had photos in her social media of working with the team there with foals at foot. I think that's really positive stuff. There's lots of really yeah. good things happening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. And from my personal background, um, I spent years and years showing horses and showing in Australia is very similar to showing in the UK and that area. Yeah. Um, and the weaning methods that I know people still use are just to, I think, around five months, take the mare in the foal, lock the foal in a stable and take the mare away. Yeah. Yeah. And that's yeah. quite often what I've seen as well. Yeah, in the similar kind of circles. The yard I was on when I was a teenager was showing yard um, and they were quite successful. And, uh, yeah, the lady who ran the yard, she recently judged the Cuddy at Olympia a couple of years ago. So she's uh, was London International Horse Shows and it's not Olympia anymore. But I'm like, wow, that's doing that. But, yeah, it's kind of, yeah. Yeah, being, yeah, I always forget that I ever had any contact with the growing world. So people are like, you go, oh yeah, the show. I'm like, oh yeah, that was a thing in my life as well. And it is, and it, it once you, I think, I think we get our clans, don't we, in our horse world. So we kind of have the sh- our showing and the showing by what you show, not just you do showing, you know, if you're doing mountain and moorlands or if you're doing your breeds or if you're doing hunters. Um, yeah, and so there's that, ex- the knowledge exchange that's going to go on there or not because sometimes there's not necessarily knowledge exchange because people want to keep their own competitive edge they don't necessarily say what they're doing because they want you to copy in case you do it better (laughs) yeah Yeah. but it's just interesting to think like from that strategy which I would presume would be the most stressful out of all weaning strategies um from my like I haven't looked at research or anything but just from the the dynamic at play um But when you think about like long-term, these horses are going to have to be separated from other horses and go to shows and be stabled lots and have to like handle lots of environmental stress. So it's like if you're putting them through that um, stress at such a young age, you're not really setting them up for success. Um, And I'm saying this with complete compassion and empathy towards anyone that still does something like this or knows the people that do this because I still know people that do this. Um, but it's just like looking at the big picture and going, okay, what's the flow on effect of this? And like, no wonder that horse had like, you can't just blame their, um, nervous tendencies on their breeding. Like there's other things at play here too. And I'm sure that that winning strategy or the way that they were started under saddle probably didn't line up with, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. I'm thinking that's it. The science supports that. If you're going to take the foal and abruptly isolate them from the mare into an unfamiliar environment, so yes, put them in the stable, shut the door, take the mare away, maybe take her a long way away so they can't hear each other. Especially if you've never really stabled the foal before, or if the foal has only ever come in to have a halter wrestled onto them, because yeah. I've seen halter training that's very much halter wrestling, um, or to get feet trimmed without any preparation of the foal and if all the all the scary things happen in the stable the stable Mm -hmm. becomes a harder place to be and while they might be shut in there for long enough to become quiet and be more handled Mm -hmm. there's kind of a psychological technique or flooding where you put your subject in an inescapable situation and just subject them to whatever it is um 
and that can have differing outcomes and not all of them are going to be yeah conducive to success later so when the horse is put in the stable in future they may be more agitated because they're wondering about what else might happen they may become more shut down yeah because that's the you know in it, we know that horses have proactive coping strategies and some of them have what's called reactive or basically passive coping strategies so Carrie Ajici's done some lovely work on this um uh, when she was doing her PhD in Northern Ireland um mm-hmm. and she's a, a now as a researcher and lecturer at um Nottingham Trent University in the UK so she's um yeah she's working hard on these things at identifying that horses do have differing coping strategies that some will become more emotionally blunted and shut down and mm-hmm. others will become much more do, do more behavior be more active in trying to solve their problems yeah and you don't necessarily i mean sometimes, unfortunately the latter and not the latter the first one the more emotionally blunted can be conducive if you want a quiet riding horse not necessarily good for mental health of the horse but yeah, yeah i've certainly seen that yeah. yeah. And what would you suggest is like, if you can, this is a good practice of doing it. Is it like handling the foals when they're still with the mare um, and then letting them naturally wean? And then how would you sort of in a roundabout way recommend that people yeah, do Yeah, that's what I've done with my own. So I've got a little team of conservation grazing ponies and they were surplus to requirement on the hill. So we just took them in. Um, so I had, uh, I have a mare called Flicker and she came in with a foal at foot called Felix and her two-year-old daughter Felicity or yearling daughter Felicity. Felicity had already been naturally weaned but was still with her mother mm-hmm. um, and that's fine just carry on conservation ponies with no um, agenda here other than to do conservation grazing. Um, so Felix um, he needed to be castrated so I basically went out and fussed him every day he was quite chatty um, we got him castrated um we carried on he um stayed with his mum she was pregnant again so he, I didn't see him suckling from about eight months of age he was quite independent after more finally with his sister I go into the, the fields we kept them in had there were several fields with big hedges between them and he would not always be in the same field as his mother um he had his family around him so he was quite confident and it was fine. The next foal, Felix, their uh, folly was born. Um, did the same with folly. He didn't get to fuss him as much. He was more nervous. So he actually only got castrated more recently. So he wasn't even castrated as a foal. Testicles took ages to drop. And we did have a bother with um, Felix because I thought I'd felt who come down. But when he went to get castrated, he stuck one back up and he would not let it back down. So he had that big ketamine on the floor and try and wrestle that testicle out, which is... Uh, unfortunate but that's what happens they are not easy to reach for a standing castration so that's what we had to do um well, yeah we, we tried to wait longer fully he ended up having to go on the floor as well because he did the same things as brother so i'm like why did we wait this long <laughs> he was going to be on the floor or on the floor um again uh he um he was the last foal so he was suckled for a lot longer i brought him and his mum down to be a companion to one of my neighbors and we put them in with her because she was worried about him as a cult as he starts to become more mature you know very unlikely to be capable but she was worried so out of politeness i just popped them on the other side of the fence um we brought his brother felix back so he had his buddy so the brothers were doing wild stuff holly was much more is much more energetic and heroic and masculine compared to Felix. Folly likes to play rearing and dangling off your throat and Felix likes that but just not as much as Folly does so it was a little one-sided but you know worked along and that's how we the suckling was basically stopped but then they turns out that Flicker and his mare did not get on so we ended up leaving Felix behind because he was the one who did get on and he's like lovely social glue in that herd now so he's there for now um, and we took folly and flicker and put them in another paddock so he's no longer suckling but he's still with his mum um and i'm praying that they don't breed with each other because i know put them but you know just fast forward it all seems well um they're now back in a bigger family group they're actually still together but he's castrated now and he's going he to a bit more independence from his mum and sometimes he's back with her and that'll ebb and flow yeah. Um, you know, and he's with his big sister Felicity as well. She's also in the same group as mum, but she's kind of stepped off into a side group with her her 
um, half sister Darcy, who's the same age, and their uncle Bryn is the gelding we've got out with them. And they're on a nine hectare cliff face, basically. So they can yeah. spread out if they want to. They don't spread out that far. But, so yeah. <laughs> basically, what I'm hearing you say is like that Amir had one fall and then the natural weaning process occurred, then she had another fall, and then that sort of continued on. And you've been able to kind of move them around through this process, and they've been pretty good. What would you yeah. say to, um, what about someone who, let's just say, let's just use this scenario. They're a show competitor. Yeah. But they want to show like the horses as yearlings at yeah. shows. Um, so they've, they don't have as much capability to keep the mares and the foals together for the whole period of time, let's just say. And yeah, what would you say in yeah. that situation? They need a familiar adult for the foal to be weaned to. So if possible, and it depends, you know, I, I've, I've seen this with Welsh pony um, people who are breeding and showing, taking the foal to show with mum, so the foal is being shown at foot, um, I think it can be, can done well, can be a nice introduction to the show yeah. environment and mum is there as that reassuring safe haven, secure base for the foal to be with. Um, you can then... The it's, if you're looking at spring summer shows, you want that yearling coming into the spring shows, obviously looking really well and being able to be handleable to the point that and and I, and I like to see them looking well handled. And I know mostly because I'm in Wales, I suppose I mostly watch the Welsh breed classes, and there is a little bit of a leaning towards having them picking their feet up and looking really flashy, and that can also. Eat, quite looking a bit wild and learning things on a horse that they perhaps shouldn't be learning but horses for courses do we say um so yeah I would be looking at you could be separating them over the winter so instead of doing it in September October going right it's weaning time if you could delay until say January and you've got the mares and the foals living in a group with some auntie or uncle horses Mm. So that when the mares are taken out, mm. you've still got the, yeah, you know, the, the, the nine month old, because that's about what age they're going to be approximately, in with a group of really adults. They're starting to get to the stage where they may have stopped if the mare is pregnant again. And if she is pregnant again, nine, ten months, chances are they're going to stop spontaneously mm. and you don't need to take them away. But Otherwise, you might do that. If you've got a good fence, you can put them on the other side of the fence. By a good fence, Britannian researchers did it with like um, a mesh fence, a tall mesh fence, and that's quite a typical fence to have in Italy because of the fire risk, because wood would burn. I always thought to get that when I'm in the UK and we can't really have a fire risk apart from on the commons where the gorse gets <laughs> kind of dry. Um, but yeah, so you, if they're not going to try and jump over or through. Um, then that showed quite good responses to the ones that compared to a group that didn't have the mares on the other side of the fence, you could just do that. The mares go out to the other side of the fence and you've got the auntie or uncle horses in and the, the, the foals, the weanlings. Um, yeah, if you've been handling the foal to go to previous shows, you've already got your handling in place. So yeah. then you're just having to adjust to the um, not having mum anymore. And, and they will do that. I mean, I've seen foals on the hill go off with older siblings and then come back. Yeah, and they're, you know, they're, that's what they're doing over the winter. They're going exploring. A mum stays where she is because she's hungry and she needs to eat and she's trying to grow another foal and she lives on the hill, so she's really got to eat. Mm -hmm. I would say with some mares, you know, you're going to struggle with the weight loss with, with weight loss. And I did with ours because I think they find it massively stressful to be taken from the hill mm -hmm. and they're loving their foals. And the parasites kind of exploded because they were stressed, their immune systems were depressed. So I did have to do quite a lot of deworming, a lot of feeding. Um and just it's not that expensive when they're only 11, 12 hands and you can go and buy some conditioning mix and some blood cubes and feed them though because you don't have to fit them a big amount. Whereas I suppose if they were thoroughbreds, that would be more expensive then. But hopefully you'd be selling your thoroughbred mm. youngster for a lot more money than you're ever going to sell a Welsh pony foal for. But yeah, so yeah, yeah, handle them younger. Leave them over the winter to separate. They might well do that anyway. If they're not, then like if the mare's not pregnant again, you may just have to separate them out on the side of the fence, depending on your fence, because you don't want yeah. accidents that could be catastrophic. Familiar adults, um, and it should all come out fine. Yeah, awesome. And yeah. that sounds so much more relaxing for all parties, like because then you yeah. you've already got the, the handling of the 
the foal established, like it's not, it's already started to happen on its own. So it's not such a big stressful event. And then it's just easier because you can just put them in different paddocks if you want to, or keep them together if that's happy, if you want to do that, or just make it your own. Absolutely. Yeah. Because you've got, um, I was going to say, escape my memory now. Yeah. It's getting the stress on the mare as well. And yeah. often in the weaning studies, so the foal stress has been studied, but more recently they're starting to look at um, stress measures in the mare as well. And they call it yeah. stress as as well because it isn't what they're naturally adapted to. Uh, but we can frame it as humans go, oh, look, she's so relieved she doesn't have that foal pestering her anymore. Um, she's not being nagged by her child. Um, but all human mums probably know that, well, it's nice to have a little bit of time away from the little darlings when they're nagging you. You don't want it to be permanent. <laughs> Yeah. So I think we we do kind of frame it a little bit that way because it makes us feel a bit better. But yeah, I think so too. Because stuff. if you yeah. if you put it into human context, this is going to sound bad. So for anyone that's triggered by this topic, close your ears. But if you think about okay, let's just say you had a baby, okay, and they've gotten to I don't know three years old, and then they just get taken away. No explanation. Nothing happens. Nothing. Yeah. That's going to be really traumatic, right, for both parties involved versus if you have your kid, you educate them, teach them about what's going to happen at school, and then probably even the school process is still a big weaning, <laughs> you know what I mean, for kids. Yeah. But, like, oh, no, they go to kindy, so there's a few hours, and then that gets built and built and built and built, and then it's less stressful. Like, we can use similar kind of uh, analogies. Absolutely. Yeah, we don't uh, – yeah, <laughs> And I, I just want to speculate it being the uh, upper classes breeding their thoroughbreds and then sending their children to boarding school <laughs> as soon as they can walk. <laughs> but nobody really lives in that world anymore. I, think. Well, I was talking to someone yeah. recently and they said that they were, oh, I can't remember what age it was. So that That's right. They were, their husband was like seven years old when he was sent to boarding school. Yeah, that, that actually does happen. I've, I've met people who've been, yeah, off the boarding school, but yeah, it's that's probably just the cousin. But even when you go to boarding school, you get to come home, but yeah, yeah not every night, which is good. Um, so yeah, that kind of security and and it is uh, unfortunately boarding school is recognized as a major stressor with professional men who then struggle to cope later in life. Mm. That's the boarding school. Um, and I guess when you think of the like cost associations, because I know that sometimes like. Horses are expensive. And when you think of the cost associated with, okay, this thing might take a little bit longer for you to facilitate, but you're going to save money because your animal is going to be like, have a better disposition. They're going to have a less, um, less incidence of ulcers occurring. The separation anxiety is like reduced. And all of these other things are at play because you've just set them up with really positive interactions with people, their environment, all of those things so that then when they do go throughout their life, they're set up for success. So it's like going to save you money, even if it feels like it's a longer thing in the beginning. I want to share one example actually of that because although this isn't a horse that's going to be sold, but if she has was going to be, then you're going to have a much better horse. There's a client of mine. I have known the foal since before she was born because we were already working with the mare. Anyway, um, it's somebody I coach rather than a behaviour um case this is that one of my I do a bit of coaching as well so this is one of my coaching and we which she sent the mare off to be naturally bred she came back foal brought up in it we had a nice little nurturing family group around this foal um we did all the early handling the haltering habituating her to stuff all while she was with her mum of course the mum is already great with all of this um, we've allowed weaning to take its own course. We have been taking, this young mare is now four, but we started taking her out when she was about 18 months too, for little walks with company, with her uncle, and, and with a, we had another youngster in for a little while as well, as a playmate. Mm-hmm. Um, gradually uh, allowing her to explore the neighbourhood, witness it in all seasons, and she's now four, and we're hopping, well, not we, my client is hopping on and off her back, not every day, actually. This is just, she's a, she's a mum like me, so she's pretty busy. So when I come down, it's kind of like her time. So, mm-hmm. You know, 
every yeah once a week every other week this is kind of the frequency of doing stuff and not in the school holidays so it's actually really spread out so if you want to start, you could do this more quickly we've just done it at this space this speed because this is what suits but the quality of what we've done is really paying off and if you were producing riding club horses if you're producing competition horses this horse would be one that copes really well with going to new places can ride in an environment with unfamiliar horses because we've worked with all of these things and is going to be a very satisfying horse for somebody to have on what was a recent research out of Czech Republic um where they looked at the performance records of show jumpers mm -hmm. and found that if a horse had only one or two riders in its whole lifetime career, it did, whatever level it was actually competing at, it was more successful compared to horses that had three, four, five, six riders in its career. If we can produce horses that don't get passed on because they are really psychologically adjusted, they're going to be more successful. And if it's got your stud's name on it, guess where the next person is going to come to buy a horse? They're going to come to you yeah 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 <laughs> makes, makes so much sense and oh I could go on so many tangents but I feel like we can talk for ages <laughs> yeah I think we've done really well we've covered a lot of winning and young horses yeah um okay well I might just dive into my sort of podcasty questions so yeah. um what advice would you give to your younger self yeah be more patient <laughs> and and be patient and collaborate because it's something I was a bit shy about in the beginning and I was always like I want to now so I'd be a bit more good preachy whereas these days I'm more laid back and I guess that's age but my younger self be like you know what go chat with people everybody is okay don't feel that somebody isn't okay because they're not doing what you're doing don't yeah. feel you have to tell people what to do go and collaborate go and listen go and work together um, mm -hmm. and don't be afraid to make mistakes because mistakes you can just turn into something that you can do better next time <laughs> yeah absolutely definitely and what is your equestrian perspective or a message that you would like to share? Yeah, I think um, being able to, to, when you're with horses, you're always learning about horses. This is one of the very first things I ever learned while well, I was nagging my parents to get those riding lessons. My aunts were fueling the fire with secondhand equestrian books. And I remember reading, oh, uh, the name escaped me, but he was like a, one of the early um, horse show people, mm. oh goodness, I'll remember tonight when I'm in bed, but <laughs> he basically said, when, you have, when you're around horses, you never stop learning about horses. And I just held that all the way through. And I think that's true. You never stop learning about horses, not just from horses, but also from other people. Mm. So everybody has got something to share. We can't know everything about horses. So the more we team up with other people, the better it is for our horses so yeah so we let our horses down when we don't look wider than our immediate bubble so yeah go and speak with other people learn from horses as well and um work together <laughs> and I think get a lot more from horses yeah definitely and I think there are so many people that are willing to collaborate so if you're someone that's kind of a little bit unsure about reaching out or approaching people in different ways that you just got to find your people and that might take a bit of time but that's okay like you'll come across people that are willing to share information and help you and be open-minded and happy days absolutely cool. yeah that, that's it <laughs> awesome and where can people find more about you okay so i have a web page um which is jenny nellis which is all one word, .co.uk. A little hard to spell, which I should have thought about that when I put it up. I'll put it I also have, I did another URL that points to the same website, which is horsestranslated.com. Um, so that will point to the same place. I'm also on Facebook, um, Jenny Nellis Equine Behaviour, and the same uh, on Instagram. They're the same posts, actually, just different engagements. Oh. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I tried to do YouTube. I'm not very good at it. <laughs> Perfect. No, I love it. And yeah, I'll put all the links in the show notes. So if anyone wants to check those out, they can. Um, but thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. I've really enjoyed it. And I think just overall, I think it's been really cool to hear an overview of your journey and how like you were wanting to do one thing from the beginning and working with horses and you just committed to that. And I think that's a really, really um, brave and unique thing to do because horses can often be 
something that you steer away from because you're not going to make money or all of those other things come at play um assumptions and yeah I think it's really cool that you just went no oh, this is what I'm going to do and you did it I'm sure there were challenges along the way that we didn't talk about but Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is. Um, we call it being a stick at it squirrel in my son's school <laughs> So I'm like, yes, I'm just going to real stick at it squirrel with the horses. <laughs> I love it. So good. Okay, cool. Well, thank you once again, and I'll chat to you another time maybe. Brilliant. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a real pleasure. Well, I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of the Equestrian Perspective podcast. If you really enjoy it, please hit subscribe on the podcast so you can stay up to date with every episode that gets released. And also, if you want to share it around, please do so. Tag me on social media at Felicity Davies with an underscore at the end. And if you have any recommendations for episodes or guests that you would like me to interview on the podcast, please let me know via social media or if you have any questions at all, I'm happy to chat and I'm here for you whenever you need. So thank you for listening and I will see you in the next episode. Bye.